to use persuasion, and he does that in, in a number of his letters. Uh, Peter and, and John also persuade. Uh, John says in his gospel, these things are written that you may know that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Uh, all of these men were different in their gifts, but God used them in different ways to persuade people of the truth of the gospel. And I believe in, in, in some ways, all of us are persuading others or, or should be persuading others to come to faith in Jesus. You say, well, I don't have a gift to speak. Well, you may not be an Apollos, who's a great orator. Uh, you may not be an intellectual like Paul. Uh, you may not even be a great leader like Peter. But whatever your gifts are, all of us persuade people of things at some time, right? Uh, you've done that in your workplace. If you work, you, you've persuaded others. Hey, I think this is a better course of action that we ought to take, and here's the reasons why. Uh, you might be persuading your kids. I hope you persuade your kids uh, of, the, of the truths of Christianity. Uh, here's what we believe, and here's some good reasons why we believe it. Uh, and, and you build those things into their lives. But all of us need to be persuading people the truth of the gospel. Why is that? Because this world is trying to persuade people not to believe the gospel. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a darkness over this land that has come over this land because we've put God out of this country. We've asked him to be out of our schools. We've asked him to be out of all these things in, in culture. And, uh, and we're feeling the results of it in our culture today. Uh, we need, as God's people, to shine the light of his truth. It's so critical that we do so. Paul goes to this city called Thessalonica, which is the largest city in Macedonia at the time. And he is uh, reasoning in the synagogues. He is discussing truth. Uh, he is opening up the truths of God's word to people who need to understand uh, and he is persuading them of the truth of the gospel. And he has quite a bit of success in doing so. Uh, it says that there, was a, there were a, a number of Jews that believed. And then there were also a great number of God-fearers. And a great number of the leading women of the city. That were putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Um, I believe that, that all of us, and Jesus even told his disciples, he said, uh, you shall have power uh, after the Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my witnesses. And so we need the Holy Spirit to help us in this persuasion toward the things of God. But can I tell you something? Uh, the average person hears the gospel eight times before they come to faith in Christ. That tells me that there is a process people go through and that if we're alert to be able to be used as part of that process, we can have a role in people coming to faith in Christ and we may not even know it until we get to heaven. But what a joy that would be uh, to get to heaven and to find that there's someone there uh, that is there because you told them uh, something that helped persuade them of the truth of the gospel. Um, so uh, we need to be persuading people through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, uh, about the truth of the gospel. The title of my message is How to Persuade People. And let's look at verse 1 of Acts 17. It says, As, uh, After they passed through Amphipolis and uh, Apollonia, uh, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Uh, some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of, of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading Women. So how to persuade people? How do you persuade people? Well, first of all, you can thoughtfully discuss. Thoughtfully discuss. Uh, in verse 2, it says on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them. Uh, that word reasoned in my translation uh, can also be translated discussed thoroughly. I like that translation because it kind of gives an idea. He's, it's taken him three Sabbath days to do this. This is no quick uh, flash in the pan. This is an ongoing discussion that he's having with them 
about the truth of the gospel. And, and he is thoroughly discussing. Now, how do we discuss? Well, you discuss Christ's truth in the same way you discuss anything else you discuss, right? Uh, you ask questions. Uh, you might, uh, if, if you're talking about uh, a sports game, uh, somebody might say, oh, well, hey, this person did really well on this. And say, but yeah, but what about this over here? Uh, what about this play? I'm not so sure he had his best game. And you're kind of going back and forth and you're talking about sports in that way. You could do the same thing uh, as a child of God talking about the Word of God, right? Did you talk with people in the culture? Um, some of you say, well, I don't know a whole lot. Well, what you do know, uh, persuade them that. Discuss that with people. Uh, some of the people that <clears throat> had the simplest presentations, I think you have the power of God on them. Uh, we had a fellow one, one time in a church that I was a part of who uh, was very, very ordinary Joe. I mean, you wouldn't, there was nothing that you'd have said, oh man, this guy's a great intellect or this guy's a great speaker or uh, this guy has a lot of charisma. He had none of those things. But he simply presented the gospel and the power of God was upon his life. And he just had a knack of bringing people that you would think would never come to Christ. He would just simply tell them the truth of the gospel and they would come to Christ. Um, sometimes, and some of you have these gifts. Some of you have been a Christian for a while. You've studied the word of God over a number of years. You are pretty grounded in the truth of God's word. And you can have discussions with people about the truth. You say, well, what if I don't know the answer to something? That's just fine. Can I tell you something? There's not a person on the planet that knows the answer to every question. If you're waiting for that day to come, it will never come. Uh, all of us uh, are in the process of learning. If somebody asks you something you don't know, say, well, that's a good question. Let me research it. Okay? That's how you handle that. And then you go and you research it and you get back to it. Uh, but interact with people. Uh, one of the things I, I would do uh, with my kids is I would question uh, things that were being taught in school. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, years ago, uh, David, he liked to play on the hill behind our house. We had this bedrock, and this rock had come off this bedrock behind our house, and he was, he was out there playing, and he discovered this rock, and it had a seashell fossil in the rock. I said, David, how do you think a seashell got up here in the Tennessee hills? He was about seven years old. He kind of squinched it. I don't know. And I said, well, I know. I said, the Bible says there was a worldwide flood and that all the earth was covered with water. That's how seashells get on mountains. And by the way, did you know my son's account was not the only account of things like that that I've heard? I've heard of people finding seashells elsewhere. Anyway, but uh, I, I told him, I said, I said, well, I said, you ought to ask your science teacher that. How did, a, how did a seashell fossil get in the Tennessee Hills? He did. He went to school and asked me. She said, I don't know. And so here, here's, how, here's, here's what, you, here's what you, you can do as you question these things for your kids. You help them realize, hey, I don't necessarily hear the whole story from my teacher. I need to evaluate and think about what I'm observing and make conclusions. Um, and so uh, that's just one example. Uh, a lot of times I would uh, uh, see something just amazing in God's creation, and I'd say, there's no way that could happen by evolution. No way. How could something so amazing, how could something so beautiful happen by evolution? And I'd just ask that question and just kind of throw it out. We move on and we talk about something else. What am I doing? I'm teaching them to observe the world. I'm teaching them to question the things they're learning at school. You can have those same kind of uh, uh, discussions with coworkers. Did you know the worldview of atheism doesn't work with the facts that we see in the world? It doesn't work. The universe is finely tuned. Uh, you can, we've, got a, we've got a video back there that talks about all the ways the universe is finely tuned. I think they're probably continuing to discover, discover those things. Uh, it is truly amazing how this universe has been designed by God. And how do you explain that with, with atheism? How do you explain how something is here rather than nothing in the worldview of atheism? 
It doesn't make sense. Out of nothing came. I mean, you don't expect to go home and find a car in your living room, do you? Unless you, somebody crashes through the, the wall or something. I mean, things don't just pop into existence out of nothing. We know that, right? So we can talk about that. Of course, we do it in a respectful way. But, uh, you know, uh, have you thought about the fine-tuning of the universe? What does that tell you about what, what could have happened to, to bring that fine to, to into place? There's not too many good explanations. I don't know of any good explanations that they have. Uh, I saw on my email just a couple of days ago uh, the view that aliens created the earth. Really? Is that the alternative to belief in God? Uh, listen, so... Um, Thoughtfully discuss and be willing to gently don't don't uh, don't mock people don't don't be uh, rude to people but gently challenge gently push back when people make statements like you know the Bible the Bible contradicts itself I said well how can you give me an example of how it contradicts itself let's talk about that uh, most of the time they won't be able to tell you an example. And the few that, that will, if, if you, there are good answers out there uh, for uh, many of those things that, that people will bring up. It, it's amazing how many people will just hear somebody else say something and they repeat it, right? Um, all right. Um, so thoughtfully discuss with people. Uh, question, how'd you, how do you, did you come to believe that? Why do you believe that? And then as they tell you their reasons, you can then compare those. And say, Have you ever thought about this? How this might make more sense? Plant that seed of doubt in their mind and help them think about the things of God. All right. So how to persuade people. You can thoughtfully discuss. Secondly, you can caringly show. Uh, verse 2, again, he says on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So you can caringly show people what the Bible says. Now, sometimes people are just ready. God has prepared their hearts. And as you share with them what the Bible says, they will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, it's, it's usually the exception, I find, of the person that's just ready the first time you talk to them. But occasionally it happens, and it's a wonderful day. I actually had a fellow years ago, some of you remember when the the movie The Passion of the Christ came out, and uh, uh, I had seen that, and then I, I, I was in a coffee shop one day, and I don't know how preachers are supposed to look. I wasn't dressed in a suit, uh, but uh, this fellow said, are you a preacher? And, and I said, I kind of grinned, I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And he said, well, he said, I saw this movie The Passion of the Christ. He said, I've been needing somebody to tell me how to be saved. Could you tell me how to be saved? That's like saying, pick, sick him to a pit bull. I, but I was all over that. I said, yeah, let's sit down. And, and we talked, and he gave his heart to Christ. And I saw him a, a couple of weeks later. He's at a restaurant and, uh, and said hi to him. And he said, well, this guy right here needs to hear what you told me the other day. He really needs to be saved. He said, so uh, sometimes people are ready. And you could just carry the show, that person. You could say, hey, something like, uh, hey, have you ever thought about whether or not you'd go to heaven when you die? And they say, yeah, you know, I've, I've wondered about that. Would you like for me to share what the Bible says about that and how you can know you're going to heaven? I asked that simple question to one fellow. He said, yes, I would like to know that. I went through the Romans Road with him. And I said, are you ready to surrender your life? Would you like to receive Jesus? He said, yes, I would. I said, would you like me to pray with you? He said, yes, I would. And we prayed through a prayer together. And he gave his heart to Christ. And it was just the simplest thing. He was just ready. All I had to do was just put it out there. I love that. So sometimes all you have to do is just carry them and show them people. Show them the truth. There's a power, by the way. There's a power in the word of God. There's a power in the gospel. Uh, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God and the salvation. First for the Jew and also for the Greek. Um, so uh, 
How do you persuade people? You thoughtfully discuss. Secondly, you caringly show. Thirdly, you creatively open. Creatively open. Verse 3. Uh, my, the first word of verse 3 in my translation is explainable. Uh, the, the word literally, it's a compound word in Greek, and it literally means to open thoroughly. To open thoroughly. Did you know the Bible says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of them that believe not? Lest they should believe and come to the knowledge of the truth. People have a spiritual blindness. How is that blindness broken? It's broken as God's people and the power of the Spirit share the gospel. And we can creatively open the truth to others as we pray and ask God to help us with the process. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife was telling me about um, a question they asked the preschoolers. And uh, there was a little girl, and it had, been, it had been a long time, maybe a year and a half since they talked about this particular topic. Uh, she popped right up and gave the answer. And, and Sherry was amazed. I couldn't believe she still remembered that all this time later. But what do those ladies do? They're creative. They, uh, they have the kids act these things out. They, have, they ask them all these questions and get them involved. What would it be like? Uh, and, uh, and they interact with them. And they deal with it very creatively. And, and it opens this up to them. Uh, Spurgeon talked about using illustrations uh, as a window to help people see the truth. A good illustration uh, is intended to take something and make it more clear and vivid uh, for people so they can understand the truth. And we can ask God to help us with that. Uh, one illustration that I love to, to use when talking to people about the fact that salvation is a gift by grace and that we can't earn it with our performance is I said it's kind of like throwing a baseball across the Grand Canyon. Some people can throw it farther than others, but nobody can get it across. That's our situation uh, as sinners before a holy God. Some may live more righteously than others, but none of us can live righteously enough. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need grace. That's why we need salvation as a gift. That's why Jesus came. He lived the perfect life in our place. He died as our substitute, took our penalty, and rose again. And because of what Jesus did, God can cancel our sin debt and uh, wipe it away and give us salvation as a gift. What a glorious truth that is. But people don't think that way. Uh, people tend to think in terms of performance. So an illustration can, can be a way to open people's eyes. Another thing you can do is simply to share a scripture verse that God brings to your mind. Sometimes I'll have a scripture verse that just pops in my mind as I'm talking to a lost person. Or as I'm talking to a saved person who needs encouragement, God will bring a scripture. And I share that scripture. And this doesn't happen the majority of the time, but there have been a few cases when I've shared that scripture and I see tears come to the eye. Why? I don't know what's going on in that person's life, but God does. And as I quote that scripture that the Spirit brings to mind, it connects with them where they are. You see? So it opens the truth. God knows just what people are struggling with. God knows just how to open their eyes to the truth. And so, uh, as we ask the Holy Spirit to help us with that and respond to Him, He can help us to creatively open the truth for people. And sometimes, you know, you don't have to necessarily win that person to Christ the first time you talk to them. It's great if you do. But uh, sometimes it may just be planting a seed. Sometimes if you're at work, you may not have time for an extended discussion, but you can ask a question. You can say, you know, I love this. I found this verse in Scripture. This might help you. Quote that verse and then move on and do whatever it is God, uh, you know, you're doing in your day. Um, but allow God to use you to be a part of a process of somebody coming to faith in Christ. It's exciting to think about. All right. So how do you persuade people? Uh, you can thoughtfully discuss, caringly show, creatively open, strategically Compare. Uh, 
Uh, verse 3 says, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. That word proving uh, can mean to present, uh, to place alongside, which I, this, I like that idea of placing alongside. Uh, Acts was written, the human author of Acts, there's a human author and a divine author. The human author of Acts was Luke. And uh, Luke also wrote a book called Hebrews. And what, did he, what does he do in Hebrews? At least I believe he wrote that. Uh, Luke, in chapter 1, if you read chapter 1 of Hebrews, you'll see he uses scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture to prove his point. He's placing those scriptures alongside each other and making his case. Uh, you, most of them are prophecies. Uh, probably Paul is doing something very similar to that here. Uh, Paul is uh, proving, laying along, alongside these things that are, maybe he's laying alongside these prophecies about Jesus. Maybe um, about the son sitting at the right hand in Psalm 2. Or maybe about uh, Psalm 22 or Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. Both of, both of these scriptures talk about the crucifixion of Jesus and uh, I believe also the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus in, in Isaiah 52 and 53. Uh, and so, um, maybe, maybe he also used Psalm 16 that talks about the resurrection. Uh, perhaps he used uh, the scripture out of Zechariah that says, uh, they will look on him whom they have pierced and mourn because of him. But he's laying these things alongside and showing them how the Bible as a whole anticipates what Jesus came to do. You see, all scripture is about Jesus ultimately. And, uh, and so helping people see that. Uh, you might even take the story of Joseph and the details of Joseph's life and all the parallels between Joseph's life and Jesus' life and, and as scripture describes it. Um, Joseph is a great type of Christ. He's rejected by his brothers who were also, by the way, the people of Israel of that day, right? The sons of Jacob. Rejected by his brothers. They were going to kill him. Uh, but then he is uh, uh, later on received by his brothers. Jesus in his first coming was rejected and in his second coming he'll be received by the people of Israel. They'll look on him and they'll pierce no more because of it. Uh, and so all Israel will be, will be saved. Uh, so the scripture uh, also uh, t talks about uh, Joseph in his suffering and then Joseph in his exaltation. There's another parallel with Jesus. I mean, you could go through, uh, you, you look at some of these uh, publications like uh, by Arthur Pink and some, some others who have gone through and showed how Joseph is a type of Jesus. It's amazing all of the details of his life that point to Christ's life. Um, so that, that's a way to persuade, um, to strategically compare these things. Um, the, the idea of prophets, priests, and kings and how they became types. You can talk about types. Uh, you can also talk about uh, the, blood, the blood sacrifice, right? Why is there blood sacrifice in the Old Testament? Because God was intended to send another sacrifice to be a once-for-all sacrifice for sin. And you can show, uh, if you're talking to somebody who's Jewish who has that background, you can talk to them about the different purposes of the sacrifices, if you know those, and uh, and say how, show how those are fulfilled in Jesus. But I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, and here's the thing: you got the Holy Spirit to help you to bring things to mind. So uh, strategically compare, put things alongside, show, build your case. Right? Uh, they do that as they're trying to solve a crime. Right? They'll they'll, they'll have uh, trace evidence. They'll have DNA evidence. They'll have eyewitness evidence. And they put all these things together uh, and, and show uh, the, the, the overall picture of the evidence they have that points to a certain individual committing a crime. Uh, the same thing is true of Scripture. There's all this different evidence, and you can show people where it points. 
Uh, and that's the idea of this strategically prepared. Wouldn't you love to have been in on these conversations that Paul had with uh, the Jewish people in the synagogue and hear how he was persuaded? I, I for one, would, I'd pay money uh, to be involved in that way. Uh, it'd be a really, really interesting thing. But God can use us in the same kinds of ways. All right. Um, so how do you persuade people? You can thoughtfully discuss. You can care, caringly show them what the Bible says. You can creatively open the truth. You can strategically compare. But you also need to completely trust. In verse 4, it says, Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. A large number of God fearing Greeks, as well as a number of believing women. Uh, regardless of socioeconomic class, these people uh, were persuaded. How were they persuaded? Were they, you said, well, they were persuaded by Paul's argument, only partially. Paul had a partner in his persuasion called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was working. Uh, by the way, did you know there's a reason Jesus told the disciples to wait for the Spirit's coming before they began their ministry? Uh, they knew a lot of things that Jesus had taught them. They, Jesus had shown them the prophecies. He'd shown them all these different things. But he says, I want you to wait for the Spirit to come from on high. Why? Because they needed him. I need him. You need him. We all need him. If you're going to persuade somebody, you need something more than just a human being can do. You need the Spirit's work on your behalf as well. And the Spirit can take our efforts, sometimes efforts that may not uh, be great guns, right? And he can do great things with those, those efforts. I remember, I think it's probably the worst sermon I ever preached. I was bored. I was preaching it, and I was bored. Okay? And that, that's pretty sad. But, I mean, I could see people were, people were looking at counting tiles and, you know, looking at the carpet and uh, checking out what, what somebody else was doing. Nobody was paying attention, so I thought. Uh, I remember I was just embarrassed. I thought, I thought, Lord, I have blown it so badly. And uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to close it. I'm going to land the plane, give a verse of invitation. Nobody's going to come and I'm going to get out of here because I'm embarrassed. And so I closed the message. I got down and, and, and offered the invitation. And I, I sensed the spirit saying, do another verse. And I, I said, Lord, nobody's going to come. I'm embarrassed. I'm going to get out of here. I don't want to do another verse. Do another verse. And I did another verse, and this man came from the left-hand side of the church, weeping. Gave his heart to Christ with my pathetic effort. That's because I had a partner. I blew it. But my partner never blows it. Aiden Rogers used to say, God can take a crooked arrow and shoot it straight. Does that not take some pressure off for you? <laughs> you don't have to have all your eyes dotted and all your teeth crossed. God can take our weakness. He, he, he delights to be strong in our weakness. He delights to use the fullest things of the world to confound the wise. God, in his power, worked in that man's life. And uh, it certainly wasn't because of my message. Uh, I don't think I was the only one who wanted to get out of here that night. <laughs> so, uh, completely trust your partner. And every time you talk to somebody about Jesus, it's not a bad idea to offer a silent prayer. Lord, help me. Help me in this conversation. And then... Pray for the person after you talk to them. Why? Because that person may have gone home. That person may no longer be talking to you. But guess who they can't get away from? The Holy Spirit. He goes with them wherever they go. Um, R.A. Torrey, I read this book years ago when, before I was even a pastor. And I was, uh, he, he would use scripture and uh, he would repeat Scripture verses that God laid upon his heart with people who were lost. 
And uh, one account that he shared was this man who, he, he witnessed to him and he's, the man said, I, I will not come to faith in Christ. I refuse to come to faith in Christ. I'm not going to talk to you again. I'm not coming back to this church. And he left. And he was angry. About three days later, the man came uh, to the church and he says, I need to talk to you. He said, I thought you weren't coming back. And he said, he said I, I can't sleep at night. I keep thinking about that verse you, you, were, uh, you said to me. And I, I can't get it out of my mind. He said, I've got to be saved. You see, R.A. Torrey had a partner who went home with that man. Who kept him up at night. The spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment, the scripture tells us. He is our partner. He does the work of convicting and drawing people to faith in Christ. We're just instruments. You heard that song, uh, the old violin. I like that song. And they're trying to sell it in auction. And it's old and beat up looking. And, uh, you know, uh, nobody's giving much money for it. And finally the, the violin master comes and he begins to pl play this beautiful music. Out of this violin. And all of a sudden they're making these huge bids. What was the difference? It was the touch of the master's hand. <laughs> Isn't that great? The touch of the master's hand. You and I are the violin. He's the master. And he takes our efforts and he uses them to make a difference in the lives of people. What an amazing thing. Did you know you can make an eternal difference? in somebody's life through a simple step of obedience and sharing and asking a question and letting the Spirit do His work. May we do that. Let me pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We ask, Lord, that You would use us to persuade others of the truth of the Gospel. Thank you, Father, that Jesus came to die for my sin. That he rose again in mighty power. And that he's forgiven me and given me eternal life. Lord, I'll never get over the fact, the difference that Jesus has made in my life. And that he continues to make each day that I live. Lord, help me persuade others of this precious truth of the gospel. Help us as a congregation to persuade others. Give us those opportunities. Help us take them in faith and trust you with the outcome. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, can I tell you, uh, Jesus can change your life. He not only brings forgiveness of sins, but he actually makes you a new creation. He changes you on the inside. Um, he sends his Holy Spirit to live inside you so you can live a new life for others. If you'd like to give your life to Jesus, um, you can come just as a step of faith. Say, Lord, I surrender to you and I receive uh, the gift of eternal life that you provide for me at the cross. Uh, if you'd like to do that today, I will help you with a prayer of surrender and trust in Jesus. Um, and, and you can get that settled today. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I've not been persuaded. I've been silent on the sidelines, and I want to I want to be used by God. Maybe you just need to come to this altar and say, Lord, use me. Uh, give me those opportunities, and let me be used by you to make a difference in the lives of people around you. Uh, whatever God's laying upon your heart to do this morning, do it. Let's stand as you come.